Hello again, class. Uh, today we're going to talk about entropy, which is probably the most enjoyable part of this chapter for me, which is for some reason one of my least favorite chapters. So let's jump into the slides here. We've got this third law of thermodynamics, which states the absolute entropy of a substance is um, at zero Kelvin in a perfect crystal is zero. So what does that mean? It essentially is telling us that um, nothing has zero entropy because we'll never have a perfect crystalline substance. Um, there's always going to be some imperfection, right? If I have a million atoms and I have this crystal, I'm never going to have every single one of those one million atoms lined up perfectly. There's going to be this accidental hole or something's going to come in at the wrong bond angle, or we'll have some imperfection in this perfect crystal, well, one little piece of carbon or whatever that happens to be in there. And we never really deal with anything at absolute zero, do we? Especially in our day-to-day -day lives. So really what we're saying is everything then is gonna have some positive amount of entropy. So that's our standard molar entropy. Again, that little um, circle in the upper right corner, that superscripted circle means standard state. So entropy in the standard state. It's an extensive property, meaning it's dependent on how much of the substance we have. 10 grams of copper is gonna have a higher entropy than one gram of copper. So we're talking about the standard molar entropy is gonna be for one mole of a substance at standard temperature, 298 Kelvin, um, standard pressure, one atmosphere, if we're dealing with a solution, uh, standard solution concentration of one molarity. And you can see a lot of these different standard molar entropies. So these are from your book. There's a table within the chapter in your book. And then you also have appendices at the end of the book that list all these different standard molar entropies. Um, and they're usually given by the primary elements. So I believe um, water is either found, I think, under hydrogen. Uh, methanol is probably found under carbon. Um, this benzene, C6H6, would also be found under carbon. And you'll notice all of these are positive values. And they're in joules per mole Kelvin. Make sure you watch those units. If you're dealing with kilojoules in half of your problem and joules in another, make sure they agree. Um, but you can see all these different values. And you can see that also gives the state. That's gonna be important to note. Um, if you're given a chemical reaction, make sure you know what the state of everything is. If you see water in that reaction, you better know, is it solid, liquid, or gas? Because the standard molar entropy for, the, for those are different. So if you're trying to solve a problem and you're dealing with water vapor, make sure you're using, you're using that 188.8 and not the 70 by accident. And of course, the more disorder we get if we go from a solid to a liquid to a gas, the liquid should have more entropy than the solid, the gas should have more entropy than the liquid because we have more potential microstates. As we get larger and larger and heavier and heavier, we should see a greater um, entropy. So with the noble gases, we're staying within a column, we're making nice apples to apple comparison. We go down, we get heavier and heavier and heavier. The entropy of those increases. We're dealing with more electrons, more protons, neutrons, more possible microstates that are available. Greater amount of disorder, greater entropy. Uh, allotropes. Same thing really when we looked at the, the phases from a solid to a liquid to a gas. Solid is very rigid, very constrained, liquids less so, gas is really not at all, so the entropy increases. Well, the same thing with allotropes. So in this case, we're looking at two samples of carbon. One's a diamond, one's graphite. We know that diamonds have covalent bonds uh, in all three dimensions, so they're very constrained. They're gonna have a lower entropy than graphite, which only has those horizontal covalent bonds, those sheets, that can actually slide past each other. So there's gonna be a little higher entropy there for graphite than there is for diamond. Uh, and complexity. In a lot of these cases, we're making an example of things that have very similar molar masses, argon to NO. But you'll notice the complexity in NO is much higher. Argon is a single atom, NO is two atoms with a bond between them. So there's more complexity there, more entropy. Carbon monoxide compared to, what is it, ethene? Same thing, very similar molar mass. Here in carbon monoxide, I only have two atoms, one bonded to each other, in this case would be a triple bond, but still only looking at bonds between one atom and another. Whereas with the C2H4, I'm looking at six atoms, I'm looking at six different potential bonds, or I guess it'd be five, five potential different bonds. Um, the entropy there is noticeably higher. 
So like it shows all the different potential microstates. We can have translational motion, rotational, and vibrational motion. Each one of these is a potential different microstate. And as we add to the complexity, we have more potential vibrational and uh, rotational modes that can occur between multiple atoms. We're gonna have more microstates and greater entropy. Um, this brings us to, oh, and dissolution. If we dissolve something, same thing. It's really just kind of almost like another phase. If I have a solid by itself, very rigid order, I dissolve it, it becomes aqueous, it dissociates, or it becomes solvated, but it, it adds to the potential microstates, adds to the disorder. So dissolving something, going from a solid to aqueous, we should see the entropy increase as well. So arrange these gases in order of increasing standard molar entropy, SO3, krypton, and chlorine gas, Cl2. So we wanna go from increasing, so we're gonna go from lowest entropy to the highest. Well. The big thing I notice right off the bat, I have a single atom, I have two atoms, I have four atoms. So I would say that we're gonna see that just by or, uh, overall increase in complexity of the compounds, we're gonna see the increasing molarity or entropy, and that's what we see there. Going from the single atom being the least complex, lowest entropy, up to that four atom system, uh, having the most available microstates, the most complexity, the most entropy. And this brings us to this last equation. Um, it's very similar for a Gibbs free energy, uh, standard entropy change. So change in entropy for a reaction. We're gonna look up all those standard entropies of products and reactants. And we're gonna do the summation of the, all the entropy of the products minus the summation of the entropy of the reactants. Um, and unlike enthalpy, where if we're dealing with the, um, an element in its standard state, the enthalpy formation for that is zero. Remember, what we saw from the third law is the entropy is not gonna be zero. It is gonna be some positive value. So we're gonna to have to look all of those values up. We're actually gonna to have to have them in that instance to solve this problem. And let's see, I think, yeah, let's see if we can't do a quick sample problem about that, illustrate what it is I'm talking about. Um, here we go. So calculate delta S for the balanced reaction. Four NH3 gas plus five O2 gas goes to give us four NO gas and six H2O gas, water vapor. So we have to go to our table and find the standard entropies for each of these. Make sure we're looking at the right formula as well as the correct um, phase. And you'll notice there's O2. If we were dealing with enthalpy, delta H, that would be zero. And if we weren't given that value or we wouldn't even need to look it up, we'd know it's zero. But for entropy, that's not the case. It's still gonna have a value. We're gonna need to go in and we're gonna need to find what that is. So these are, the uh, enthalpy formations for a single one of these. So we need to do products first. So the NO, well, we have four of those. So we'd have to multiply four by 210.8. We're gonna do the summation. So we're gonna add our other product in there. And of course, I'm gonna uh, write that incorrectly and I have to go in and erase because sometimes my brain and my hand don't move at the same speed. And I'm mad at myself for that. Um, so there's all our products right there. And then from that, we're gonna subtract out the reactants, four times 192.8, and then the other reactant, um, the oxygen, five times 205.2. So, yep, looks good. So let's do that. What do we get here? 843.2, yep. I grab the wrong? Of course I did. 
God dang. No. Or over there. Okay. So the overall entropy reaction or change in entropy for this reaction would be equal to that. And we get a positive value. And uh, looking at it cursorily, it, it makes sense. We're not really gaining or, or ultimately changing the complexity of the atoms ter terribly much. Uh, everything's staying at a gas and going to a gas, but I do only have nine molecules on the left-hand side and I have 10 on the right. So I would expect to probably see a small increase in entropy, which is what we get there. So make sure you know that equation. You're not gonna have to memorize any of the standard entropies themselves. Um, you'll either be given those or of course you'll have access to the table, but know how to use that table and know what this equation is and how you're gonna plug them in. Um, so hopefully it was a short video. Hopefully it helped maybe clarify some of these points. Uh, this is the only video I have for this chapter. Uh, hopefully the rest of the videos are good, and I'll see you in the next chapter, uh, Electrochemistry, which is actually one of my favorites.